Thank you to the Reverend Janet Roberts for reading the scripture today, which is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 10. And the title of the message is, Which Way Down the Mountain? We've talked about, at different times, mountaintop experiences, and they tend to be, uh, maybe that's metaphorical, that we've had this high, wonderful experience, mountaintop experience. But a lot of times that terminology or that name is used to describe an experience that happens spiritually. And often uh, when you're working with young people and all of that, or when you think about what has happened in your own past, you think about that mountaintop experience that happened at camp. And for those who, who grew up here in Southern California, uh, especially here in Redlands, I would imagine, the mountaintop experience was literally on a mountaintop. We would go up to camp in the mountains. Most of our camps are in the mountains. When, when I was in Indiana and I would talk about mountaintop experiences that happened at, at camp, most of the camps were not on mountaintops because in Indiana, really, there weren't very many mountaintops. Uh, so it, it, it was metaphorical there, a mountaintop experience. But here, camp experiences are usually on a mountaintop. So, um, but you think about those experiences where as maybe as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, you went to camp or you went to some conference and you had a realization or you had an experience with God, a powerful experience with God. And then you come home, you come down the mountain. And when you come down the mountain, sometimes you get back into the routines of being back at home. When you were a kid, maybe you would get back with the same old crowd and things would go back to way, the way they were. Or maybe not. Maybe you come down and your life truly is, is changed from that mountaintop experience. And um, you do head in a new direction. Maybe you sense a call or a sense of purpose that happens on that mountaintop. And when you get back home, uh, you start heading in that direction. And it's not easy. It's not easy to come back home because on the mountaintop, especially at camp, you're spending every day studying scripture and sharing with others and, and praying and focusing on spiritual things. And it becomes a daily routine for several days in a row generally in that kind of experience. And then you go back home and you maybe lose those kinds of patterns. But the question after a mountaintop experience is always, what's gonna happen when I leave the mountain? Which way am I gonna go when I come down from the mountain? This Sunday is called Transfiguration Sunday. and Every year we look at the transfiguration. Now, if you're a Baptist, you don't necessarily do it every year, but, uh, but it is in the lectionary on this particular Sunday every year. This particular Sunday, meaning the culmination of, a, of Epiphany. We've had Christmas and Christmas tide. We moved into Epiphany, that season of discovery and encountering God and, and coming to know God better and coming to know who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. All of that is this sort of aha, Epiphany time. And the last Sunday of this Epiphany season is the Transfiguration Sunday, where Jesus goes to the mountaintop and he's transfigured. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it, it is the end of Epiphany, the culmination of Epiphany, but it's also the turning point to Lent, the point at which we begin to focus on the cross and head toward the cross. 
And so today is Transfiguration Sunday, and we look at the story as it's told in the book of Mark. Now, a little bit of background. Before Jesus and his three, three disciples, James, John, and Peter, go to the mountain, uh, before that, we have a time where they are traveling. And at one point, Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's after, you know, people say you're this, that, and the other. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so there's this big moment. And he says, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Peter's the rock at that moment. And just a little bit later, Jesus starts to explain that he's going to die. He's going to suffer and he's going to be rejected and he's going to die and he's going to rise again. And Jesus, and Peter takes him aside and says, don't say that. At which point Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So within the space of just a very short time, maybe even minutes, Peter goes from being the rock to, to being Satan. And then as Jesus continues to talk and share, he says, there are some of you standing here today that will not taste death until you see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now, the first thought is that they're talking about Jesus' second coming. You know, when Jesus comes back in power and everything goes to being the way God has designed it to be and God is in charge and everybody knows that the second coming. But maybe it's more than that. It's where the kingdom of God, seeing that the kingdom of God has come with power. Could it be the resurrection? The resurrection would be a, a pretty good example of the kingdom of God coming with power. Even Pentecost, the falling of the Spirit on the church. And as we begin to think that way, it opens our eyes to the idea that there are moments in history and maybe moments in our lives where we can see the power of the kingdom of God. And then it says, six days later, could this be what Jesus was talking about? That some of them there, namely three, James, John, and Peter, would see that the kingdom of God has come in power. They go up to this high mountain and Jesus just takes the three. And there are other times where Jesus just takes these particular ones of his disciples. And he takes these three up to the mountaintop. And as they're praying, it says, Jesus was transfigured. And then the only explanation of what that looks like uh, or what that means is that Jesus' clothes became so bright that that there was no bleach that could make clothes that white. That's the description. But it was some incredible transformation in a way, or some being seeing Jesus maybe as he is, but nobody had ever seen him that way before. And so the three disciples are watching this. And not only that, but in that whole process, two others join Jesus. And somehow they know it's Moses and Elijah. And as Jesus and Moses and Elijah begin to have fellowship with one another in these glowing outfits, Peter, James, and John are terrified. They're terrified. And they don't really know what to do. And Peter somehow feels obligated to say something. And so Peter says to Jesus, it, it, it's really good that we're here. What an amazing thing, he, 
he's implying. It's really good that we're here. How about if we build some dwellings for you and for Moses and for Elijah? At which point this cloud comes down upon them. And you've been in the mountains when a cloud suddenly lands on the mountain. But this cloud comes down among them. And in the cloud, they hear a voice that says, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then the cloud goes away and the glow goes away and they are alone, Jesus and the three disciples. And then Jesus says to them as they pack up and they go and they're walking down the mountain. He says to them, don't talk about this. Don't let any, don't, don't tell anybody about this until I've risen from the dead. And the disciples at this point are going, what is he talking about? Being risen from the dead. Now, when you think about what this experience was about, what was it about? It depends on who you are and how you're experiencing it. But I'd like to think about for a few minutes what this experience was like or was uh, what it meant for Jesus. In the story of Mark, at this point in time, Jesus is at a turning point. He's had his ministry in, in Galilee and it's been very successful. He's healed people. He's cast out demons. He has, um, he, he has fed thousands of people with a small amount of food. I mean, all of these different things have happened. He's also begun to have some controversy and some disagreements and some uh, discussions with the religious leaders. And they are beginning to feel threatened by him. But he's had this ministry, but now his journey has turned toward Jerusalem. And he's begun to talk about the fact that he's going to die, but he's also going to rise again. And he gets on this mountain and he's experienced the rejection and maybe even subtle persecution, uh, knowing that there are people who, are, who want to maybe even take his life, even at this point. He's also discovered the frustration of working with these disciples of his. Peter, who says at one moment, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And at the next moment says, what are you talking about dying? And Jesus is on this mountain. And when he's done on this mountain, he could go two different directions. He could go down the mountain and head back to Capernaum, where he has a pretty good thing going. Or he could go down the mountain and head to Jerusalem. Could it be that Jesus on this mountaintop is at this turning point where he's wondering, questioning, confirming what it is that God has called him to. He's going to be at a point of no return. I remember one time I was at a retreat. It was over in the Pasadena uh, um, area at a retreat center. And the retreat center backed up against uh, the mountains. And there were these trails that would go off into the mountains from this retreat center. And I decided I had this free time in the afternoon and I decided to go for a hike. 
And so I started on this trail and I kept going and kept going and I was following a stream and I would get to where it looked like the trail maybe was narrowing and ending and I would sit by the stream and then I would look and I would go, oh, if I crossed here, there's the trail, I could pick it up again. And so I would go a little bit further. I'll just go a little bit further, I thought to myself. But the, the further I went on this trail, the more I thought, you know, I'm all by myself. I didn't tell anybody that I was going to go on this hike. It was before cell phones, so it wasn't like I could call anybody. What, what happens? And of course, the further I went, the more the questions would come in my mind. I would get to another uh, spot where the trail ended at the stream and I would sit there for a few more minutes and I would think, well, maybe I should turn back now, but oh, the trail continues. Maybe I should see where it goes. But my thoughts would also go to what, what if happened? What if I slip and fall and break my leg and nobody finds me here? I don't know. Maybe nobody else has those kinds of thoughts, but I did, but then I would say, I'll just go a little bit further, a little bit further. And instead of turning back to what would have been a lovely hike along a stream, I decided to continue and see where the stream went. And sure enough, as I've followed the stream, I came to a corner and as I came around the corner, there was a waterfall, a beautiful waterfall. And had I turned back somewhere along the way, it would have been a nice hike. It would have been a lovely time, but I wouldn't have seen the waterfall. Jesus goes to the mountain to pray and God sends to him this experience this transfiguration, there's no other term for it. And we don't exactly know what it is, except it was bright and glowing. And these two, these two historical figures in the faith of the people of God show up, Moses and Elijah. And these are two people, two prophets, in the past, who have had mountaintop experiences. Mountaintop experiences when they were the lowest, the low, as low as they could be, when they felt defeated, when they felt rejected, when they felt that they were not accomplishing anything. Moses goes back up to the mountain after coming down with the law and seeing the golden calf. And God appears to him there. And Elijah, all the other prophets have been killed and they're after him. And he goes to the mountain and he says, I just want to die. And it says that God appeared to him, but didn't appear to him in the earthquake or into the loud wind and the storm, but God appeared to him with a still, small voice in the silence. Both of these prophets, people of God, in their discouragement, in their lowest moments, found God and heard God on the mountaintop. And Jesus communes with them and fellowships with them. Maybe they encourage him, but certainly he finds commonality with them. And then you hear, after that, after Peter makes his comment about the, the dwellings and all of that, and the cloud comes down and you hear words that are familiar, the words that are, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
and I think for the sake of the disciples. Listen to him. But Jesus hears these familiar words, the words that he heard at his baptism, the words that he heard at the very beginning of his ministry. When he's being baptized, he's, he hears these words of encouragement, these words of blessing from God. And now he hears them again. He's reminded of his mission and reminded that God is still with him. It's one of those things like when we do a baptism uh, at church and after the baptism over is over, oftentimes I will invite people to come at the end of the service as a moment, a quiet moment, and touch the water of baptism and remember our own baptism. Remembering God calling us, remembering that decision when we said yes to follow Jesus and live our life for him. And so Jesus recalls his mission, what God has called him to do. And finally, there's James and John and Peter. Jesus didn't just experience this mountaintop experience all by himself. He had James and John and Peter. And yeah, James and John and Peter have a lot of moments where they're not maybe as helpful as they could be. They're not as far along as they can be. But Jesus doesn't experience this at, at alone. He experiences with in community. He experiences this with other people. Other people who can say, hey, remember when that happened? Other people who can come down the mountain and continue to have the conversation of what did that mean? What are the implications of that for our lives? He didn't experience it alone. And that's what's so helpful when we have these kinds of mountaintop experiences, when there are other people there who come home with us and we're able to help one another with whatever decision that was made on that mountaintop, whatever experience we have on that mountaintop, we're able to then begin to figure out what does this mean for our daily lives? And we don't have to do it ourselves. We do it with other people. And not only that, we come, if we do it in commu community, we have various spiritual practices that we do to together in Christian community that help to keep alive, but not just keep alive that sense of call, but give it direction and help it to move to the next level. And so there was Jesus with James and John and Peter who were there for that experience. He wasn't alone. He didn't go down the mountain having just experienced that by himself but there were others who witnessed it. And so on that mountain, we see that Jesus is there with those who understand, those who have gone before, those who have experienced being on the mountaintop and having their direction renewed and revived when they're at a point of giving up. Jesus is there and he hears the voice of God once again reminding him of his mission. And not just that, but that God loves him. And then finally, Jesus is there in the company of others who experience it and have seen what has happened to him. And they go down the mountain together. Mountaintop experiences. 
I don't know if you could consider this time of COVID as a mountaintop experience. In fact, most probably wouldn't. There are other things that are going on in our lives in the last year. In fact, this Sunday is exactly 11 months from the last service that we had in person. And so this year has been a strange one, one that we would have never planned or anticipated, expected. And a lot has gone on in this year, and we keep talking about that. We talk about the lessons in the wilderness and, and all of that. Other things have happened. The summer where we began to remember our state of being in terms of race relations because of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. And as we begin to examine ourselves, as we've lived in a way that we haven't lived before, maybe we've looked at our relationship to God in a new way. Or maybe we're at a point where we might be ready to give up. We don't know what we want to do. And the idea of spending that many more weeks or months like this or in some form of this uh, is disheartening and difficult. And we may be ready to give up. But then again, we may be on the mountaintop. And I'm not necessarily talking about this thrilling, exciting time, but a time where we come and we encounter God in a new way. Can we think of those who have gone before, who have experienced similar things? Maybe not the same thing, but maybe you're at, point, at a point of giving up or at a point of saying, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. Where are you, God, in all of this? Are there those that have gone before us? People maybe that we read about because they've literally gone before us. They're historical figures or they're people in a part of our life in the past. Or maybe those that inspire us in the present, that keep on going, even when discouraged, even when it looks hopeless, even when we're just tired and we don't want to go on anymore. Can we be renewed in our understanding, first of all, that God loves us? God loves us. And God is still here. God is still present in our lives. And if we just listen, we can hear what God has to say to us. Maybe not in an audible voice, but in so many other ways. Can we be reminded of our call? to follow Jesus and what that means in our lives, the mission that God has given us. Can this time on the mountain not only remind us and refresh us of that, but give us a clearer view of what that means now and in the future? And finally, we're not in this alone. There are so many others that are going through this as well we are going through it together. And maybe we can't see each other day to day from head to toe like we have in the past, but we can continue to be in contact with one another and encouraging one another. And as we move out of this season, out of this time, out of this wilderness, as we come down from the mountain, we have experienced this together. What is God doing in our lives as we come down from this mountaintop? But not only that, 
Recently, I heard an interview with Brian McLaren, and he was talking about the state of the church right now. And one of the things that he said was that we are at a turning point for the church. The church has the opportunity for a fresh start. What does that mean? Here we are on the mountaintop. Are we going to go back down to Capernaum and do things the way we always have? Or are we going to go down to Jerusalem, knowing that it will be challenging, but knowing that that is where God wants us to go so that we may experience resurrection, so that we may experience what the power of the kingdom of God is. The reality of the power that comes with the kingdom of God. Are we ready for that? Which side of the mountain are you going to go down? Which road down the mountain are you going to take? Which way down the mountain? Amen.